Okay. Um, so we have a lot of updates on the technical front. We also have some good updates on the organizational front. So, so I'll just dive right in. Um, Kent, you want to talk about getting the Hello World contracts compiling? Sure. Um, I mean, if, so, if there was some screen share, that would be even even cooler. Cool. That that works. Um, let's see. Let's hope uh, IntelliJ can hold. Um, so I mean, just to give a quick overview, um, Greg and I are going to be working on the compiler, um, the source to source compiler from Roland to Rosette over the next couple of weeks. Um, I guess the format's mostly going to be like Greg is going to be teaching me how things work and I'll be diving into the code hopefully translating what um, he has taught me. And so I'm going to bring up IntelliJ right now. Um, let's see, share screen. So can people see this? I can see it, yeah. So this is IntelliJ, just the um, the IDE that um, we're working on. And so if we run the Scala console, it takes a bit to load up. Um, actually, meanwhile, I can show the Hello World contract. And so just um, explaining the contract a bit, here we have contract the name is hello world and it takes two parameters um, world one and world two and what's happening here is it's waiting for a message on world one and once it receives the message it sends the the message out on world two and so it's essentially a hello world world contract and here, um, we need a few import statements, but after that, we can essentially just go ahead and run the thing. And that executes the compiler. Um, and here's the output. Um, this is Rosette and should be, that's, that should be it. Um, Essentially, you know, there, there's some work to be done on the side of Rosette to finish up the implementation of Produce, but um, this should just work. So yeah. that's so that's an um, exciting start for me, and uh, I'll turn it back to you. No, no, this is great. This is really, really good. We can walk through a little bit what the, what's going on here. Um, mm -hmm. So first of all, we're, uh, the full compiler to the Rosette DM bytecode is a composition of two compilers. One is the source-to-source -source compiler that Kent just got working for on the Hello World example. And then what, what, what the output of that source-to-source -source compiler is this, these Rosette expressions here. And then there's a compiler that runs from Rosette to the Rosette DM. Right, so let's see. Uh, I don't know if I've got one on my laptop. I have one running on. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I've got it later, and I'll, I'll bring it up so people can see the Rosette compiler working and see by curve um, uh, But essentially, that compiler together with a runtime that implements the tuple space um, is what's necessary to give the Roland contract and semantics. So that's why Kent was, was saying that, that um, we need the, uh, the produce method. Essentially, if you go look at the um, uh, mobile processes for programming the blockchain, the code for the tuple space stuff is published there. Um, so you can, you can actually see that code and how that, how that works. So that's, um, uh, this, is, this is major forward progress for us because uh, it'll, what it does is it allows us to proceed in, in two phases, right? 
So we can have work on the Roland compiler going forward while we're doing work on, the, on uh, re-implementing the Rosette virtual machine. So people can be testing these contracts against the C++ implementation, um, but uh, we're also doing a clean room implementation, and we also have major update on that. Um, so now we have um, a BNFC implementation of the Rosette bytecode, both for the pack bit representation um, and for the uh, 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 an assembly language uh, um, representation. So, um, uh, and the reason the reason we need both is is really for human support. We could just do the whole thing as packed bytecodes, but if you want to read those bytecodes, it's really hard, right? And so, even for the Rosette compiler, uh, as as it as it was written ages ago, um, we have an assembly output format, but we never had an assembly input format. You know, you know years ago when I was working. Uh, in a class at NYU with, with a guy who wrote the Ada compiler. Um, you know, he showed us some uh, secret undocumented parameters that you sent to GCC to like, and, and basically they had like 17 different stages of the parse tree uh -huh. that you could print out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a special, you know. That's exactly what's going on here. Yeah, this exactly. is a compiler pipeline. That's exactly yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, oh, I, I want to I want to touch on that in just a minute. I'll just complete this thread of thought, and then I'll touch on that um, because it's something that Joseph Dimon and I have been uh, talking about a lot more vigorously recently. Um, so, uh, so, so the the by using the BNFC, and I, I strongly urge everyone to go look at the YouTube video from the Casper Hangout on Monday because Mike demoed. The, the, the parser uh, being generated from the BNFC and then parsing for Haskell. But, but because we've used BNFC, this, this, BNFC is a level above, you know, something like COP or, um, or uh, Bison or Lex and Yak because it generates parsers for all of those platforms. Okay, so... so and also... Oh, so, so what this means is we have parsers and bindings for the parsers for Haskell, OCaml, Java, C, C++, um, C Sharp, F Sharp. Wow. All, we have bindings for all of them with one spec. You press a button and you oh, auto-generate, which the, the reason this is important is because we want conformance and compliance for implementations across all those platforms. The only platform we don't touch on right now automatically from the BNFC spec is Python. So I feel sad about that, but, you know, <laughs> the rest of the world. <laughs> um, so, 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 uh, so, again, I strongly urge people to go look at that. It's all, all of this is checked into GitHub. So please go, go check it out. And then also go look at the, the Casper Hangout video from, from Monday. Where, where we demoed it. I'm not going to demo it today because we have a lot of other stuff to talk about. Um, but but we, we can demo it, and if people want to see demos, just you know get online and we can demo that as well. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, so now with respect to the compiler pipeline, um, this is something that we've been thinking about a lot. And basically since April of last year, um, I've been proposing that the whole compiler pipeline, the whole tool chain, in fact, all register the inputs and outputs on the blockchain. So this allows people to put tool chains together and support. So think about a decentralized IntelliJ, right? So, so the IntelliJ tool chain reads your source from the blockchain, transforms it into an intermediate representation, and then, uh, and then another program takes that, transforms it into an intermediate representation until finally you've got bytecode that is optimized for your specific application. And oh, you... Really like you've been allowed it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And this, 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 enable, this enables um, the tool vendors to also take part in the economic uh, infrastructure, right? And this is very, very exciting for me because, I mean, think about it, right? I mean... IntelliJ's model is it's free until you've got so many features you can't, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's just right for microtransactions, right? And that, that's really what we want. 
And, and especially when you think of, when you think about the way our team works, so we've got these specialized namespaces which represent specialized functionality that's glued to the blockchain. So, for example, you may have a SAT solver, right? And you've spent 25 years developing this SAT solver, right? And so then you do bindings for your particular SAT solver to Roland contracting language, right? And and then and then the optimized the, the optimized calls that take the, the Roland contracting language down to you know inline calls to your SAT solver, right? That's a part of the tool chain that your SAT solver provides. And it's a few pennies, you know, to, to optimize your code down to, down to what your SAT solver does, right? And this, 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 you know, works not just for SAT solvers, but for linear algebra packages. You know, take your pick where, where, where you have this massive um, uh, 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 investment in special purpose compute, right? And now they can just plug in. Just plug in legacy systems. It, exactly, exactly. And, and they're participating in so so we bootstrap right. This this to me feels like so I have an article on my blog which is like a page and a half that talks about how you can use the decentralized oracles model to uh, um, fulfill um, kind of the requirement of, of criticality on expensive computation, which computation is yes. You know, what I, you, know, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like when, with, with what you're describing, security becomes a problem because if somebody, you know, compiles in a backdoor. Yes, that's right. You have to have a number of people confirming that the compile, compile that's code is exactly correct. what I was thinking of. You that's that's exactly right. The way you do it. Yes, yes. Is, uh, <laughs> so, so the way you do it is you set up an oracle where everybody can basically like bet yes. on the outcome. Yeah. yeah. And then what you have to do, Greg, get this. You have to occasionally inject the correct code. Well, well, in order for people, in order to make it worthwhile for people to actually check. That's 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 <laughs> that's part of, that's part of the uh, puzzle. But the other part of the puzzle is the ladle al algorithm. So for the la for the ladle algorithm, we generate type systems, and then at every step, at every step in the pipeline, we can auto generate a type system for that intermediate representation, and then and then you carry along typing information. At every stage, and because you carry along typing information, you have much, much more information about correctness. This this typing information is very fine grained about behavior, well, not just about I, input I, and output. I don't think I'm, I'm yet fully like comprehending that whole typing information. Well, um, good, good, good. So, so I, I should I should also point out we have we have a, another update on, on the on the whole ladle stuff. So before um, we had been thinking. Um, that that all that we would essentially be doing the type checking by model checking, um, which is which is fine. It's per, you know there there are systems that do this now, and, and it's perfectly sound architecture. But more recently, we've been able to nail down the proof theoret theoretic side, so we can do the type checking in in, in, a, in a much more efficient type normal. It, the format looks like a standard Hanley Milner. Uh, style type checking. It's not the same as the Henley Milner algorithm, but it's very similar to that that approach. So, um, and again, over the last uh, three uh, Casper Hangouts, I've uh, I've given detailed descriptions of running that algorithm. So, the way the ladle algorithm works is you input your language spec or your VM spec, and we auto generate the type system for you. Now, there's another input to this, which is how you want to collect your results. Now, what do I mean by that? A type can abstractly be thought of as a set. What, what's the set? It's all the programs that type that way, right? Uh, now, it's, it, in, in Ladle, we're, we're, we're more general about that. The collection doesn't have to be a set. It could be a list or a tree or a bag or, or a graph, um, anything that can be represented as a monad. So, um, so, so then your, your membership of the, the, the typed program in the type is, is it in the collection? Right? So you, you provide us with the spec for the language. So what is the spec for the language? Just as you've seen in the rolling spec, a spec contains um, the, the grammar that's going to generate all well-formed programs together with the, the transition rules. So like in the case of rolling, it's the com rule. I've got this program waiting on input. I've got this program producing this output. 
they hook up and they synchronize at the point, the channel, like the Hello World One channel. They synchronize at that channel, and then and the data from the output swims over to the data, to the waiting program on the input side, and, and you, you rewrite the input program um, to incorporate that. You know, it's just basically just sorry, so, so, sorry, because I lost you a little while ago. Okay. Um, okay how, how would we summarize that? Like, like, is that, you're talking about the, in advance and correctness chain. Right? I'm talking about an advance, but, but it's, it's like, uh, so the analogy, um, uh, people used to write parsers by hand, right? Right. And, and then people were able to say, you know, this is so regular right. that we can write a parser generator and have right. the, the spec. So we, so type systems and type checking turns out to be very much like parsing. Recognizing that a particular expression is in a grammar is very similar to recognizing that a particular program types in a certain way. And because of that, there's a similar kind of algorithm to parser generation. There's a type system generation. Oh, right, right. Okay? Right. And, and once you have, once, once you recognize that, you can generate type systems for lots of languages. You just have to input um, the language in the format that the type system generator expects. So that's where, uh, uh, and, and so now we, we've done that uh, for Rolang, but we can do this for lots of languages. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty that, that's pretty exciting, and um, and that dovetails into another thing, which is that um, we have a, a typed based notion of Casper. So so that when when your validators have certain kinds of types, then they perform correctly. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 another advance that that we've been working on, which is. Um, which I think is incredibly powerful. Uh, and the reason it's uh, super powerful is because it allows us to give a general purpose abstract characterization of what consensus is. Mm -hmm. Consensus is a specific kind of algorithm called a trace. And this is, this is equationally specified. Like in, in, in category theory, uh, uh, which is the mathematical framework in which to write this down, you write down a list of equations that say when your program is in trace. And then you can just check. You can check. You, you hand me a program, and then I go check these equations, which, which can be automated in many cases. Um, I check the, the program conforms to these equations. And when your program conforms to these equations, I know that your program is a kind of consensus. Now, the reason this is important is because if you look at what Vitalik has been doing with the whole Casper framework, is he's been taking a wide variety of consensus algorithms, not just proof of stake, but uh, PBFT and other kinds of consensus algorithms. Like, uh, like in the Casper Hangout from this Monday, uh, Vlad described a very, very simple consensus algorithm um, that is none of the traditional algorithms. Yes, exactly. But the, the, the core insight that Vitalik had is you can replace the traditional mechanisms of consensus algorithms with slashing conditions. So you, can take, you can take standard consensus algorithms and rewrite them to use slashing conditions, so these economic incentives, and get a new form of consensus. Now, this is, for him, this is like an insight in his bones. But what we really want is we want to, uh, to turn that into an algorithm. You hand, me an al you hand me a program that ensures consensus in some way, shape, or form, and I produce a new program that's like that one, but using um, slashing conditions, using economic incentives. In order to be able to do that, what do we got to do? We've got to be able to say when a program is a consensus. Yeah, type check. We got to type check that the program you handed me is in fact a consensus algorithm, and then we can apply this economic transform. Mm -hmm. right. So, so that's also what we've been doing, and we have we have we have major progress on this. So, I'm extremely excited about that. But let me recap a couple of these things yeah. uh, because the way I internalize it is is a little simpler than you're explaining it because <laughs> that's where I'm at. Um, so. Um, 
so there can be multiple consensus implementations and, and they can vary as long as they conform to an outer a type, uh, both obviously structurally and behaviorally. Yes. And um, is that is Casper a specific one or is Casper that outer framework of consensus? What what now is what Casper? Uh, that depends on who you talk to. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we'll save that for another discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing, and I, I think I made this point last week, um, was uh, I remember reading on on Slacks, uh, you know, a, a, a troll-like person made, uh, or they were in a troll-like mode when they made the comment that correct by construction is just this buzzword that the project says that means nothing. And of course, that very much irritated me at the time. I understood. Um, uh, but I just want the, those of you that are, are viewing and listening to, to, to know that this, um, this is a, a software engineering discipline that um, when you have a, a provably correct uh, um, type theory and other um, models um, and you use an engineering kind of approach and step-by-step -step, um, uh, demonstrate those transforms into the programming languages and into the virtual machine are correct and you have less to reason about, uh, that therefore is going to be less buggy. Yes, there's a chance that a mistake could be made. Um, but um, but you, have, you have mechanisms yeah. to 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 um, to a quality check exactly. those kinds of things so, exactly so, so go ahead uh, so I was just going to just summarize by this this notion of correct by construction goes very deep it's not just a buzzword oh absolutely yeah. I mean so so the, the example that I've been using a lot in this in this uh, setup is um, there's a notion of computation that is um, explicitly created by the Ethereum Virtual Machine 1.2. It's, it's, it's an embodiment of a specific model of computation. Um, now, Solidity has a very different idea about how computation uh, proceeds. And so when you produce a compiler from Solidity to the EVM, you have a proof obligation. The proof obligation is that the bytecodes you produce somehow match with your intent in your Solidity program. Right? Now, in correct by construction, you would either have Solidity derived as a language, derived from the model of computation in the EVM, or you'd go the other way. You'd have the, you'd have the model of computation that's embodied in, in um, uh, Solidity uh, derived to an intermediate represent, representation, which then derives to a virtual machine. And they have neither, none. Yeah, yeah, and they have none of those. But, yeah. but there are security implications. So the security implications are quite straightforward. If you don't know what constitutes well-formed legal bytecode, now this goes right back to our discussion about tool chains and security. If you don't know when the bytecode faithfully represents the original source code, you're screwed because anyone can inject anything into that bytecode, and now you have a halting hard problem to determine whether or not it does the right thing. And, and this is this is one one of the reasons that uh, Vlad Zamfir a month ago approximately said, if their month made is two months, that Ethereum is unsafe. Right. This that's is exactly. Right. This is the type of reason why he said that. that that's that's correct. So meanwhile, we, we, what's being discussed is like. Uh, the ability to basically have legacy programs plug in and verify that what you say is what you get. Not not just not not legacy programs. No, uh, it's but just it's just basically the idea is that you write source code, you save it to blockchain, but then rather than executing it in your client, then you know a number of people can simultaneously run a compiler on that, generate bytecode, confirm that it's the same bytecode, save it on the blockchain, get paid the payload. Right, what I mean by legacy is that you were saying that someone was building something for 25 years. Oh, yeah, so, so that, but that's a separate idea. Right. right. So, so the, the other idea is um, uh, apart from mm -hmm. the bytecode stuff, you'll have um, built-in functions. Like, you're not going to have bytecode to do file I.O. It's just not going to happen. Right. right. You're going to use system primitives for that. And then you, and then you have issues about whether or not, um, how, how much you want, how much you the system primitives you want to take on board, right? Greg, I had a question because I was talking to Joe Denman uh, a couple of days ago and he brought, was he on? No. He was. I think he's on. Yeah, I'm on. Oh, hi, Joe. Hey, Joe. 
Hey, what's up, guys? I, I was re re remembering our conversation from a few days ago talking about the efficiency. Uh, hi there. And uh, I just kind of wanted to backtrack to that for a minute because just playing devil's advocate here, um, I'm curious why it is that, Greg, um, we can't just have source code to be like the only thing that, that we actually say in the blockchain and then run interpretive uh, interpreters. Oh, run right, right. interpreters? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, so uh, I want to hear your explanations for that because, because I'm not entirely sure I understand. I mean, obviously, the efficiency is, yes, efficiency is a concern, but I don't understand why it's such a big thing. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I, I can't really hear, I can't really hear you. There's, there's a lot of feedback uh, happening in the room. If you can move closer or uh, and, and restate, then I'd be happy to answer. Well, okay. Oh, so, so, sorry about that. So, so what, what Alex just asked about was uh, an efficiency question. So what, why not just interpret Rolang as opposed to compiling it to some bytecode-based execution framework? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a great question. Um, and so I thought um, our, the conversation that we had, Alex, was um, I think more so in terms of uh, what concurrency enables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe, I, I understand, but but it actually goes here too. The, the whole question of efficiency: Why do you need like why why is Solidity compiled into bytecode? Sorry, I'm move move closer. Why is Solidity compiled into bytecode and bytecode saved on the blockchain rather than Solidity being saved on the blockchain? You know, why is Rolang compiled into bytecode and saved on the blockchain rather than Rolang just being interpreted from the contract as, you know, as needed? So, so I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to answer that in terms of historical data, right? If you write an interpreter for Java versus running the Java B in bytecode, it, it's clearly slower. Yeah, but why is that a problem? Um, why, is that, why is the speed a problem? Yeah. Oh, because you get one-tenth the speed. So... Well, if someone comes along with Well, you know, here's why I'm asking that question. It's because, to me, that's not the bottleneck. The bottleneck is uh, the time it takes for multiple parties to agree on the transaction rather than verify that the transaction is correct. Okay, so, so, you're, so implicit in your um, statement there is an assumption that most compute will be transactions. And I believe that, that, that uh, only a percentage of compute will be transactions, and that most compute will be local resource computation. So in particular, reading and, reading and writing uh, to and from memory, reading and writing to and from local store, uh, performing addition, performing subtraction, performing multiplication, uh, those kinds of things. And then, no, but they still result in a transaction, and then it takes a shitload of time to, to confirm that. No they don't necessarily result in a transaction. Ultimately, they, so for example, so imagine- but Remember, we're talking the contracts recorded on the blockchain. When, when you're talking Rolang as a general purpose computer language, language you obviously have to compile the Python code because like, if I were to run you know, a uh, neural network developed in the Rolang that kind of like does all kinds of mumbo jumbo and parallelizing my GPU and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. That, cool. That being clear, we're talking about the blockchain specifically. Yeah. We are talking about why do we need to report bytecode on the blockchain, not why do we need bytecode. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. So, so with with respect to that, what you want is auditability. You need if you're going you have to source code, code, you're not full of it. Uh, only if your source code is the execution model. So you, what you what you want what you want is where the rubber meets the road, where you have actual execution that should be recorded. Now I, I tend to believe that you want to record both. For auditability, you want to record source and bytecode. That way, at any point, someone can come along and say, "Well, this was the bytecode. This was the source. Was there anything fishy here?" Anybody can run source and then just check the transaction. Um, well, they, they, code, they, can, code is they, not they can all, they can only run source if they have an interpreter. That's what I mean. Why is why is the blockchain? I mean, an interpreter is not that different from the compiler that just runs right after having compiled the code. Well, it is from a from an it is from an efficiency and speed perspective. 
So, so the source is going to be... Well, kind of going back to that, why do we need efficiency and speed in actual execution? Of it's, but it's not just... That, remember, it's not just execution, it's also storage, right? So the bytecode is going to be like, you know, a much more compact thing. So you just talked about recording both source code and bytecode. So yeah, but that's for auditability, right? You can, you can all, you can, you see what I'm saying? So for, from an auditability perspective, you can, can take this offline. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I very much appreciate your, your concerns and, and, and they're, they're interesting ones. Not a concern, it's kind of like more a, more a theoretical question about yeah, yeah, what it is with priority, what, what it is we're optimizing for. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very worried personally about optimizing for the wrong thing because people yeah. generally start optimizing for performance long before they uh, sort of actually know that the performance is to be optimized for this stage. And, um, and I hear you. you know, the, the, nice, the nice thing about Rolang is that the, the Rolang execution model, what the virtual machine does versus what the language does, they're so close that it hardly matters. They're so, and, and that's the point. This is what Ed was talking about with respect to correct by construction, mm -hmm. right? So, so the, they're so tightly um, matched. Uh, it's not that they're tightly interwoven from a separation of concerns, but that you know what you do over here is what you do over here, and and what you do over here is what you do over here, right? So the representation is faithful; it's full and faithful, and that's important. All right, we'll talk more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, these are these are great questions. I, I I love this kind of discussion. Um, but I'm glad you brought Joe into the mix because another update is well, what Joe and I have been talking about with respect to the pricing schedule. So Joe, you wanna you wanna show people what we've been doing? Um, sure. Let me just uh, screen share here. Yeah, cool. Cool. Um, so essentially, it comes down to we want to um, we want to take a program in source code and identify um, grammar items, and then we want to uh, run it through a function that decorates those grammar items with a uh, with a cost. So we want to map uh, whatever grammar to a cost, um, and we want that cost to be tethered to something uh, to, to the simplest semantic representation of computation. Um, which would be uh, the, the instruction set, like what instructions are actually used and how we're executing them, what our arguments are, etc. cetera. Um, so the idea here is to identify language elements and then map those language elements to a set of instructions that would ultimately execute those. Um, and then to assign those elements a cost and then to run the compiler as we normally would. And what that allows us to do um, is essentially take what used to be generic cost assignments um, that are typically used in optimizations such as grammar tree solving and um, you know, space-time optimizations where we uh, essentially assign a, a relative cost to computation based on uh, whatever you know, other language items are near it. Um, and then we kind of just like solve for the simplest or the lowest cost solution. Um, but those uh, cost assignments are uh, are, they're, they're, I mean, they're not tethered to the actual uh, computer resources that we're consuming. Um, instead, uh, like I said, they're generic. So if we can take uh, cost assignments that reflect the actual resource consumption and then uh, use those in optimizations anyway, then what we get is a program that's optimized based on uh, true resource consumption which is actually a very uh, powerful idea because uh, optimizations then reflect actual reductions in complexity. Um, so essentially, we're gonna take a language item, uh, which here is described as a row, um, and we're going to map that to a quadruple uh, that reflects accesses to memory, uh, registers, storage, and, and the network. Um, and uh, so uh, essentially the, the cost of, uh, we, and, and we can divide this uh, in two ways. We can divide it uh, based on data types and we can uh, divide it based on functions or uh, instructions. So the cost then of a single byte of a single instruction would be 
um, whatever the cost of that instruction is, however the uh, user uh, decides to label that cost, whatever they think it is, uh, plus the cost of storing that bytecode. Um, and then obviously uh, the cost of, of a byte, um, since you know an instruction is one byte in length, uh, then it's simply going to be uh, it's simply going to be additive here. <laughs> Um, and the second, then, uh, we want to be able to identify uh, primitive data types that we're going to be operating on. Um, so those are, you know, standard. I don't have to go through uh, primitive data types, but uh, ints, chars, uh, whatever re references on the JVM. Um, and then we want to uh, tie that to how much those, uh, those primitives uh, or how much space those primitives occupy. So in most cases, uh, the, the primitive data types, at least on the JVM, um, are all of the standard word size, so they're 32-bit. Uh, they're 32-bit uh, values. Um, even even ones that are smaller are extended. Uh, they're either uh, sign extended or zero extended to occupy one word size. So we're pretty much uh, uh, pretty much for the most part we're occupying the same amount of space uh, for all of our primitive data types, aside from longs and doubles. Um, and then we want to take our uh, whatever our our language, uh, you know. Uh, whatever our grammars are, our, our, our grammar elements, uh, and we want to, like I said, assign those to grammar. So for an input, um, we want to say that if x, or in here, I'll just. Yeah, this, is, this is actually, this, this shape here is probably the best one, right? Uh, so for our input, uh, and this is the standard transition rule, we want to send some data packet on the channel X um, and have it received by a separate process running on a different thread, um, and then to execute uh, that process P on the thread with uh, that message as an argument. And this is standard uh, transition rule. So that P prime is actually substitute. Right, yeah. And then you don't send that Q, you send Q. There you go. Right. And right. And in our grammar today, we don't have a dot between the four and the three. That's old, old pie calculus. Yeah, there we go. Cool. Um, so in the case that uh, x is a channel, which it is, because uh, x is essentially a variable, um, and y is of some type t coming on, then we want to say that the cost of our input primitive um, is actually a recursive representation of uh, the process. So uh, P prime here, uh, we're going to let P prime uh, and this tuple, which, uh, or the, the tuple that, that is P prime and some cost assignments where R is the quadruple that I mentioned before, uh, the total cost of registers, of memory, of storage, of whatever it is. Um, we want to let the cost equal um, the cost of accessing X here. Um, and the size of whatever we're holding at x um, plus uh, r. Uh, so in this particular scenario, uh, we don't have an input condition. This is pretty much our standard. This is the simplest form of input that, that we can have. But uh, but it is it is gener it's it's generated from and based off whatever the cost of accessing uh, this memory location in this case. Uh, uh, the memory location is. Uh, so on the JVM, that would be a, a load instruction. That would be an A load, which loads a reference from X into, um, into our operand stack. Nice. Um, and we kind of want to evaluate uh, pretty much all of our, all of our uh, language primitives uh, from that perspective. Yeah, we don't have to go through all of them, Joe. I mean, just no, that, yeah. that, that, that first one kind of, yeah, but yeah, walking through the Scala is probably a good idea. So, so let me just sorry, sorry to interrupt, but let me just jump in. So sure. the, the, the rule format there is very much like the kind of rule format that we have for the virtual machine. So under those assumptions that X is, is uh, a, a reference to memory and Y is of type T, then the calculation of the annotated cost of the four comprehension is written in terms of calculating the annotated cost of the continuation plus so plus the the, um, the the cost of the read, okay? the cost of the uh, of getting the data in. That's that's the shape of that rule. Now, right. now this kind of calculation goes almost straight over to um, uh, OCaml. 
Uh, like well, literally, you could take this code and it's almost straight OCaml. Mm -hmm. It's very close to Haskell. If you turn it into Scala, which is what uh, Joe was about to show us. Can you scroll down a bit, Joe? Can you see me? Oh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, scroll the page down a bit. Here. Yeah. So, so this is how you turn that rule into Scala code. Um, so that's that's kind of that's kind of cool. And then and then the other piece. So, so this is there's some elements here that maybe are, are you know uh, forests lost for the trees here. Phlogiston is not like gas. That gas is a one component number. It's a scalar. In this model, phlogiston is a four component number. It's a vector. Okay, and then. And then the translation from rev to phlogiston is, is like a metric. It's, it's giving you distances between these vectors, right? So this allows, a, and, the, and, the, and the metric changes depending upon market costs for memory versus compute. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. It's memory, compute, what are the four components? Uh, network storage. Just storage. So all the all the compo all the components memory, that were component, uh, memory long term storage uh, network and compute, right? So so now we have we have a fine grained representation of the actual resources, right? And this is this is what goes into this is what goes into our pricing schedule. So as the market begins to shift, so it turns out you know this year um, uh, 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 um, Intel produces a new chip that's blazingly fast and dirt cheap. Then the cost of the cost of memory maybe goes up relative to the cost of compute. Next year, you know, one of the major memory manufacturers produces a, a new form of memory, and it flips around. And our pricing schedule has the ability to reflect those differences in the market. Right. Yes, honestly, it's, it's a much yeah, it's a much yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a much coarser measure of what's going on in, in, in storage screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Quick question. So when we have foreign functions, I was talking to a guy, for example, that uh, in the context of our chain would be calling out to a foreign function that does video compression because he's got a whole library to, to, to compress a video onto the 12 form factors that it needs to be, right? Yeah. So we were talking about that. How would foreign functions be costed in this? So, so foreign, functions, foreign yeah. functions like that, which are essentially going to be treated as an extension of the primitives, mm -hmm. right, become reflected in the compute cost. Okay. So, so you so there'll be a separate pricing schedule that that the vendor who's providing these foreign functions got it. come up with, right? Got it. And that gives them the ability to compete. Add it to the I, schedule. I, exactly. I, I'm off I'm okay. offering I'm offering a SAT solver at this kind of cost per primitive. Got it. I'm offering a SAT okay. solver at this kind of no, cost no, per primitive. That's what I want to do. <laughs> And it's, and, it, and it's also important to know that uh, this isn't the first um, necessarily, uh, this isn't the first application to resource analysis of, of a computational program. It's been extensively studied over the years, like the, the Mobile Resource Guarantees Project, or uh, MRG, was, uh, was, was based on the idea that you can analyze, uh, you can analyze a program's bytecode um, and then after it's been serialized into bytecode, you can ship it around um, to different places on the network in bytecode form, uh, and that code or that bytecode carries with it uh, some sort of proof. So uh, especially with the proof theoretic work that, uh, that Greg and, and Mike Stay have been doing, um, our codes, whenever they're received by someone, uh, are going to carry a set, like a, a formal proof that says we can you know, we can, we can prove and we have proven these qualities about a, about this program that you're getting. And one of those line items would be the resource consumption of that program. So uh, at that point, the consumer of the bytecode can uh, examine the uh, kind of the proof statement and say, okay, well, either this bytecode is too expensive for me to run or, uh, and so I'm going to reject it or it's well within my, uh, my cost parameters. So I'm going to accept that code and I'll run it for you. Exactly. And the other, the other point here is that remember that this calculation to phlogiston is upper bounds, right? We can't give exact numbers. That's all being part but, but under assumptions about how long you're, you're likely to run um, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, assumptions about size of data types and those kinds of things. 
then we can give upper bounds. So if you give us this much rev, right, you'll get this much phlogiston, and this will give you this much running of your content. That, that's the, the rough shape of how the salt fits together. When you average it out, that's enough for a, a node operator to, to give a forward contract on what phlogiston they commit. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or right. how much rev. And, and then, yeah, and that's that's the other thing is we're trying to support a futures market right. uh, for, for node operators. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They exactly. build their business case to build out their data center. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> or, exactly. Or, or which fits in very nicely with Nash's Nash Foster's vision about about this kind of stuff, right? So, yeah. so we're providing that infrastructure, and we're doing it in a way that, again, everyone can check the math behind what we're doing, and everyone can see that our code for the pricing schedule matches the math, right? So again, correct by construction. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, that's that's that update. I think that's the bulk of the technical updates. I know we've been talking for a long time. Uh, thank you, Joe. That was awesome. That was Thanks. really really cool. Great. Um, I want to turn it over. I know Ed and Nevni have been uh, doing a lot of yeah. stuff uh, with the with the consensus uh, conference, and and also there's some organizational stuff we can talk about. But yeah, I'll just give a, a very brief update. Um, you can put the camera on me or not either way, but. Um, so uh, one, uh, you know, uh, our chain holdings uh, added a independent contractor whose name is Shin Guy, Shin Guy who's doing uh, market and product research. So uh, that's awesome. Um, we're having discussions with a, another gentleman who's on vacation. Hopefully we'll bring him on, uh, a developer. Um, and uh, we have our uh, first board meeting for our chain holdings uh, next Monday. And... Uh, also, have been having a number of good investor conversations and uh, several queued up for uh, actually 10 minutes from now and uh, this evening and tomorrow evening, which, which are awesome. Um, the uh, Consensus 2017 conference was a, a really big, well attended uh, conference. There were like 2,200 people registered. Um, uh, it was interesting talking to and listening to presenters. Uh, from Japan and Middle East, Dubai, where a lot of this influx of, uh, of capital into uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin markets lately uh, is coming from because in the case of uh, Japan, of some regulatory clarity and some uh, what in effect is advertising in newspapers. Um, you know, there's been a lot of articles uh, on, on, on cryptocurrency, so they're very excited uh, in Japan at the moment. Maybe overly so, but uh, they, they just <laughs> nationalized Bitcoin. So, excuse me. They nas Japan nationalized Bitcoin. What, is it? Uh, what does that mean? What does that, does that mean? mean? You could pay for anything in Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. They, they clarified the legal constraints around it. Yeah. So, uh, um, and you know, uh, essentially that uh, opens up some capital flight um, options as well. So there's <laughs> Which a, is a little <laughs> interesting. But but uh, but that's why uh, one of the reasons, and then. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's a Dubai Ethereum um, uh, project. Uh, the uh, exchange uh, in the Middle East and in Dubai has actually sees a lot more Ethereum transactions through the exchange than they do Bitcoin, which is interesting. Um, we talked to a, a number of uh, vendors and potential partners about uh, different use cases around uh, micro. Uh, payments and monetization of content and, and have uh, some, some great conversations there. We had great conversations around uh, identity and wallets um, and, and some of those are, are quite promising. So um, yeah, it's been a, a great week. Uh, I won't go on just because of uh, the importance of, of the time. We have five minutes left in the Hangout. Um, so there are a few other updates. Um, one one that was really pleased to that is that we've we've signed Evan Jensen on yes. uh, yeah. again, right? So we we, yes. we we renewed his contract. He, he did a really great work in the formation of our chain. He did indeed. And uh, now we're 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 carrying that forward. Uh, yeah. for the next year, I think. Yeah. So Evan is uh, the uh, general counsel for both our chain holdings and for our chain cooperative now. Yeah. And um and now. On to uh, one other topic, which is kind of interesting to me and, and really has to cuts to the heart of, of governance, um, is I am, um, you know, we've had, a, we've had a lot of issues around Slack. Um, and I, what, what I think I'm going to try as an experiment 
um, uh, now that Evan has um, put together the filing, for membership, we have to file state per state. And Evan has put together the filings for uh, enough states for us to consider membership in those states. And, and when, once that domino was lined up, then we can start having members only venues. Great. So I'm going to begin. I'm going to begin with a rocket mm -hmm. chat based mm -hmm. um, uh, members only venue for, for communication. Mm -hmm. So if you sign up, you get access to the rocket chat channel, um, and and we can talk there. I'm stepping back from Slack. I'm just I'm just finding it way too noisy um, uh, and. I, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's next to impossible. You have other things, things to be working on. I just I have, I have, I have well, it's not it's not that I just I just I just find that the people um, the, the, the just the, there there isn't a sense of well I can be efficient and say less <laughs> and get more done. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know I'm, I'm like one of the worst offenders sometimes. No, I no, go on I, and on and on at the mouth, and I apologize. No, I, I, you should be doing the things that you want to be doing rather than the things you don't. I think <laughs> that could be said for everyone. Right? So, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just fine. I'm finding the discourse on Slack is not as productive as I'd like it to be, and so I, I, I want to step away from that and 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 spend more of my time. And then, and then I, the next part of the process in my thinking is. Once we have established the culture on the members only channel, then maybe we can widen it out again and, and add, add more people because there'll be enough people there who can kind of help self correct yeah. and have a more, have a more productive, mm -hmm. the culture will be established. People can hear the tone and the tenor of effective and productive discourse. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, 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 a, that's a step that I, it, it, I don't believe in censorship, not into that. I'm totally into transparency. But it's it's also not transparent if people are just spewing out stuff, right? And the interesting stuff is hidden in, right. in totally. you know volumes and volumes of commentary that, that don't yeah. have. With, it, without it, a general it, without a general guideline, I think that there's very there's very low chance that order actually arises from chaos. <laughs> my experience just just because to be playing some some little bit of a devil's advocate. My experience Please. is that. Um, we are yet to work out a, a kind of a rich enough official communication channel for our chain. And we've been uh, using Slack, where Slack is just not the best medium. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and people, I think the, the, the unproductive discourse you are referring to is a natural consequence of the way that it's kind of a bit hard to stay the form. Oh yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. So so let's just hear that message and not lose that. No, I think you're absolutely right. And the, the other thing, the other thing I've, I've thought about a lot is um, that, that different people have different modes of voting. Like I know there have been a number of people on Slack where I point them to like five different. Um, Videos. I say so. Look at the the following three Casper Hangouts and the following two Art Chain Hangouts, and it documents in detail everything you're you're asking about. And they're like, I don't want to see video, and you just get written down, right? Well, you know, even though what's on the video is the link to the document and walking through all of the documents, it's still not good enough for them, and that's because their mode is more text based rather than video based. And, and so I, I understand that we're going to have to have a, 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 an array of different kinds of, of media to, 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 to properly serve the community. Um, so, so I, I hear you. The, the, the I, think a, I think a great model for, for those, and, and one that's been significantly tested, is um, explainer videos in, uh, that use, um, they use screen projecting tech and uh, graphic tablets, similar to the Khan Academy videos, you know like introduction to row calculus, where you just draw out and kind of freestyle on whatever orientations that are useful uh, in using row calculus. Um, so those like, like a series of those videos that are uh, at least explaining the fundamentals and, and why we've chosen that model would be extremely, extremely helpful, I think. Uh, and and not, not anything that's necessarily behind the keyboard, but that's actually drawn out. That seems to keep people's attention. Sweet. Well, listen, uh, we're unfortunately, uh, at the top of the hour, I think we lose the room. We also have to meet with other folks. 
Um, I really, so we're going to have to call it here. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's everyone's time and effort. Thanks to Pencilworks and Nathan. People can tune in tonight. We're going to be doing a broadcast, uh, and we have. Oh, I have to take this. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> That's the best way. You're going to be doing a what? <laughs> I gotta know. <laughs> so that that'll start at uh, uh, six p.m. Eastern time, or maybe six thirty, but right around there. Let's see. See, okay, but thanks again, Christian, for all your help uh, on, on all the, the recording stuff. It's, it, we, you know, it makes our lives so much easier to just know you're so reliable and you're always there. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. no problem. I, I should, I, I think I'm going to head over there in like an hour, an hour and a half. Cheers. Cool. Cheers. All right. Cool, guys. All right. Later on. Rocking. Greg, do you have time for